Microfocus, creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and this is Gary Kildall. On our program today, we're talking about the problems of computer security. And I imagine by now just about everyone has heard of the movie War Games and the kind of computer security problems raised by that scenario. But more typically, problems with computer security do not involve spectacular things like nuclear war, but rather mundane things like stealing money and stealing information. Gary, our guest on this program is Don Parker. He's considered the world's leading expert on computer security. And he says something very interesting in his book on computer crime. He says, data stored in a computer can be safer than data stored by a physical means, like in a locked filing drawer of some sort. Yet here we are doing this program, and there seems to be a sense that the security of computer data is kind of vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Well, there are techniques uh, that can make data more secure, as long as those techniques are used. Uh, unfortunately, it often takes a clever individual to come along and break the system before those techniques are applied and we find out how vulnerable these systems are. Uh, you know, we're raising a whole new generation of computer-wise people through the personal computer revolution, and there's bound to be a portion of that population that's going to use that knowledge in some kind of malicious way. Uh, the, uh, today, I guess, uh, computer crime really is a problem because it's a matter of uh, information is power, and when that, po uh, that power is, is made available, through unguarded information, then it's a threat to all of us in the society. Uh, Time-sharing services are particularly vulnerable because they're designed to be shared by a number of strangers who make a phone call. And we're going to take a look and just see how easy it is to make that call. It's pretty easy to get into a computer database. All you really need is a personal computer, something like this, some terminal software. You also need a modem, which connects your telephone to your computer, a telephone, and you need to know the phone number of one of these computers. I'm going to dial up a computer database right now. I happen to know the number of one. It's just a local call. It's not even a toll call. And we'll wait to hear a high-pitched tone, which tells us that the, compu the host computer has answered. Okay, the computer has answered, and we're going to now just go into a normal log-on procedure in which the computer is going to first ask me for my ID number, and I happen to have one, so I'll enter that. And if the host computer now accepts my ID number as a legitimate number, it will proceed to ask me for my password. And at that time, I'm going to have to come up with uh, meeting another test here to get into the computer database. And it's now asked me for my password, which I will type in. You can't see it on the screen because the program is meant to protect the security of my password, so you can't steal it from me. And if the host accepts it as it did, you can see I'm now into this computer database. You see how easy it was for me to get into that computer database. Of course, I was a qualified user. The problem is that even unqualified users can get into these computers. They're called hackers, and they try to get into these computers just for the sake of finding out what's inside. And by using common passwords and even sometimes randomly chosen code numbers, they can get into banks, hospital records, even federal agency computers. Global thermonuclear war. Fine. <laughs> All right. In the film War Games, adolescent hackers gain entry to top secret defense programs and play nuclear blackmail for real. Although experts claim that the possibility of this happening is essentially zero, federal officials are now planning to strengthen the very tight security measures that already exist. If mischievous amateurs don't seem too threatening, there's also the professional thief, a new kind of spy who's traded in his trench coat and camera for a keyboard and video display. And how to foil this new breed of information thief is a problem faced by a growing number of companies and institutions. Can a computer really be programmed to keep its secrets secret? Society has a huge investment in computers and an even greater one in software. What's more important than the financial investment is the degree to which we have come to depend upon computers. Without them, databases are empty. Words don't get processed, numbers don't get crunched, and the speed of information handling to which we have grown accustomed slows to a crawl. 
one might think that the protection of such essential and valuable resources would be routine and substantial. But this is not always the case. Recently, most of our time has been spent improving and expanding our systems, adding to their flexibility, making networks, and basically being more productive. The security aspects have often been overlooked. Additionally, good computer security often runs counter to making computers accessible, friendly, and easy to use. We'll find out more about the need for adequate computer security in the rest of the show. In the next segment, we'll meet one of the leading experts on computer crime. Now let's get back to the program. Our guest today is Don Parker from Stanford Research Institute. Uh, he's a foremost uh, expert in computer crime. He's been working in the area for 30 years now. Uh, Don, welcome to Computer Chronicles. It looks like with the widespread use of computers in society today that uh, we have a whole new high-tech uh, criminal. Can you tell us a little bit about the scope of this problem, computer crime? Yes, unfortunately, we don't have any statistics on this computer crime problem. Therefore, we have to learn from it based on kind of a case-by-case -case approach. For instance, uh, in just the last four years, we have had the largest funds transfer fraud 10.2 million dollars. We had the largest in bank embezzlement, 21.3 million dollars. We've had the largest securities fraud, 53 million dollars. We've had the largest commodities fraud, 50 million dollars. And the largest inventory fraud, 67 million dollars. This is um, an indication that the more we are using computers, then the larger the losses potentially are and we're certainly breaking a lot of crime records mm -hmm. the more we use computers. So you think the escalation is a real problem right now? Yes, it's, um, it really is an escalation because I think the, that uh, business crime is probably going down in incidents the more we use computers. But at the same time, when the loss does occur, it tends to be larger. Can you give some idea what uh, characteristics of a, 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 cr a computer criminal is? What, what sort of individual do you find doing this sort of thing? Well, we've interviewed about uh, 35 of these people so far, at least of the more sophisticated uh, computer criminals. And we find that they tend to be uh, young, but then uh, people in the computer field generally are young anyway. They exhibit the Robin Hood syndrome, or it's a variation of Robin Hood. It's stealing from the rich and keeping it. But mm -hmm. it's the idea that they differentiate very strongly in doing harm to people, which is highly immoral to them, and doing harm to organizations that they can easily rationalize. Not only that, they're doing it to a computer, and the computer can't cry or hit back. And so uh, the computer is an ideal target for people who could not possibly come up and stick a gun in your face and steal money from you. That would be being a criminal. But when you can do it through a terminal or a computer, then it's an entirely different matter. These people do not, do not see themselves as, um, as criminals. They see themselves as problem solvers. They have some intense, unshareable problem that they're trying to solve. And they are in a position of trust, and they find that violating that trust is the easiest way to solve their problem. Don, are you talking about amateurs here or, or kind of career computer criminals? So far, most of the problem has been from amateur white-collar criminals. However, now we're starting to see a, a, an increasing number of what you might call career criminals, people whose uh, livelihood on a continuing basis is dependent on, on, uh, on crime. And you might expect that since for several years now, almost every major prison in the United States has been teaching data processing to the prisoners. So they do have an opportunity to learn the technology. And they're finding that they can't engage in their cr uh, traditional crime except in this new environment, this electronic environment. What are you, uh, Don, what are some of the techniques that people uh, use, criminals use, to attack a computer system? Well, we have about 1,100 cases in our research files at SRI now. And based on what we have studied over the past uh, 13 years, there are a number of, of uh, common techniques that are emerging. 
The most common one is we refer to as data diddling or false data entry. It's changing data before it goes into the computer, but relying on the computer to hide the evidence of the false data. We're also dealing with very sophisticated techniques such as Trojan horses, logic bombs, salami attacks, piggybacking, uh, data leakage, mm -hmm. um, super zapping, and so on. These are all of the technical or jargon terms for these techniques. Could you take one of those and explain, for example, a Trojan horse seems to be a fairly explicit term. What, what, would the, what would that mean? It seems to imply that there's something built into the program. Is that the case? That's right. A Trojan horse is one of the most fundamental criminal methods that has been used. And it is the idea of taking a program and building secret instructions into that program so when the program is executed in a protected domain in a computer system, it not only performs what it is supposed to do, but it also does the additional instructions as well. I see, and this would be used to maybe put money into someone's account, an employee's account, or something like that. It could be used then for a whole variety mm -hmm. of programmed frauds within a computer mm -hmm. system that might use a technique like uh, Logic Bomb, for example, where you have uh, programmed a branch instruction in a program so that when certain conditions for the fraud to occur uh, are, are optimal, then the time bomb or the logic bomb goes off and causes the crime to be perpetrated. There seems to be, a, that seems to be a sort of an inside attack on a computer system when you put in a Trojan horse or a logic bomb or something like that. Now, we've seen an example earlier of the war games uh, where it was, uh, the system was attacked from the outside by attempting several passwords and, and uh, uh, systematically gaining entry to the system. Is that, is that something that actually has taken place uh, uh, where you try to go through a whole sequence of passwords and then you actually find out one that fits and, and goes into the system? Yes, there's a whole uh, range of, uh, of malicious system hacking techniques to gain access mm -hmm. from a remote terminal where the name of the game essentially is to impersonate an authorized user. That is, you have to know the person's ID and uh, password to gain access. There is a scanning technique where you can automatically or sometimes manually simply scan telephone numbers, gain access to a computer, and then scan various possibilities of access codes, of passwords, to find or hit on one that then is um, uh, access to that system. How about user-friendly systems? Are they a help or are they hinder in the, in the computer crime? Well, that's a, a part of the war that we're raging today. Mm -hmm. uh, we all want our systems to be friendly. And unfortunately, a system being friendly is almost the opposite of its being secure. And so we're trying to balance. We're trying to find the balance between a friendly system and a secure system because the number of people who have this capability to access these systems is growing uh, very rapidly. And so we have um, a, an enemy that is increasing in size and in sophistication, mm -hmm. and therefore we can no longer allow our systems to be as friendly as they have been. Now what about the, uh, there's a, I guess we'd call a computerized community bulletin board uh, network that's grown up around uh, the whole technical hobbyist area. Uh, you talked about a pirate uh, version of this. Can you tell us a little bit about what one of these pirate bulletin boards would be like and what the purpose is? Well, as you know, bulletin boards are extremely uh, uh, useful uh, uh, services in the computer field. But unfortunately, there are some of them that are set up, as you say, for malicious purposes, referred to as, as uh, pirate boards. In fact, in one listing I saw recently, we found 128 of these so-called pirate bulletin boards across mm -hmm. the country. They are used for intelligence purposes among malicious system hackers, and they often will broadcast the uh, uh, telephone numbers of computers and any passwords that may be available and describe various protocols for logging on to other people's computer systems to engage in this unauthorized access to systems. Excuse me, Gary and Donna. In a minute, I want to get to looking at some solutions to the kinds of problems you've been raising, Don, and we're going to do that in just a minute. Most of the discussion revolving around computer security deals with computer crime. There are, however, other accidents and conditions that we need to guard against. First, 
We must protect our computer operation from natural disasters such as fire, power outage, floods and the like. Second, systems should be protected from the accidental destruction of data. When someone unintentionally gains access, or if an incorrect terminal procedure is executed, or if a programmer accidentally destroys current data while modifying an operational program. We can't always prevent damage, but we can ensure continued operation by storing backup copies of programs and data files. Third, we need to take reasonable precautions to ensure that employees do not abuse their access to computers with excessive personal use. Fourth, we must protect our equipment from unauthorized use by outsiders. Good access control, including personal passwords, systems and log monitoring, separation of responsibilities, and external balancing controls are some of the procedures for guarding against intrusion. In the next segment, we'll hear from one of the foremost experts on computer security. So let's get back to the program. Don, you've given us a good idea of what some of the uh, problems are related to computer crime, so why don't we take a few minutes and figure out what some of the solutions are. Uh, we have joining us also uh, Jim Holmes from TriData Corporation. Uh, Jim has a product that uh, helps us secure a dial-up system. So, uh, Jim, could you tell us a little bit about the product? Certainly, I'd be delighted to. We've come up with one approach to be able to help secure dial-up networks. As you've discussed with Don previously, dial-up networks have the uh, requirement of dialing in and usually entering a logon or a password that the system itself requires. Now, we've gone one step further, and we've taken within a 212 modem type device, an auto dial modem, that would reside on the front end of this processor, our timeshare system. You would place our device in, and it has what we call an answer verification capability. We can go through, and I'll give you an example of how we would store one. Let's say your name was Adam. We could put in your name and a password that you would use to access the system. So we enter AA for add and answer verification, and then type in your name, Adam and put a space in and then enter your unique password. And we could put in a password of anywhere from one to 250 characters. Typically, your passwords that are used on systems are five or six characters. The longer the password, the tougher it would be for someone to break in. Mm -hmm. Now, we found often people are trying to use 20 or 30 character passwords if they're really intent on trying to provide security for the dial-in operation. Once we've entered the command here, we could go back and identify exactly who has access to the system from outside through dial-in ports by looking at a directory of answer verification routines. Upon receiving a call to the host computer where the system would be typically connected, we would go through and check for any of these given passwords. The passwords can be contained or control how many characters are received before the call would be disconnected. One of the problems that occurs in a lot of the dial-up systems is when you dial in, the system will repeatedly allow you to enter the password, and it will come back and say, error, re-enter password. With our device, after you've re-entered it once or twice, it will automatically disconnect the call, thus preventing someone from gaining access to the system. And that's the way we're controlling the answer portion of the dial-up environment. Now, in addition to that, there's also an originating portion which can be used to help control our secure networks. Many of the companies, the larger companies today and telephone operating companies are using our device because of the sophistication of being able to remotely configure passwords and log on procedures to their systems. By allowing them this remote configuration to the system, and that's done very simply, let me give you a demonstration. We would do AD for add a dial directory. We would put in a label, let's say we're gonna call a uh, an accounts payable system and we could put it in ACCT pay space put in the telephone number of the system we want to call and then space over and put in a password that would be sent to the system and the password would just be stored by putting in a sequence of characters again they could be entered from the local keyboard or the unique portion of our system is that they could be downline loaded from a remote uh, terminal or a remote mm -hmm. computer and by doing this, you can put in, again, from 1 to 250 character password. Now, the, do I understand this uh, correctly, is that the basic idea is that you dial into the computer system, and then the computer system dials back to you again to verify that you're the actual person that you say you are. Is that correct? 
Well, with our device, what we're doing is dialing into the system and entering a password. Once mm -hmm. the password has been entered, at that point, you then have access to the computer system itself. Yeah, I think there's, a, there's another system, Gary. I think okay. the, the back is security system, which has a thing called DigiLink, in which, in fact, what happens is it's, uh, you have the salami technique. I call it the pizza defense, mm -hmm. you know, where the pizza parlor calls you back to make sure you're the guy who ordered the pizza, where the host computer calls the dialer back. Uh, to make sure that the dialer was in fact the proper party uh, requesting the okay. services. Well, do the, these, uh, Don, do these kinds of devices, do they really adequately secure data? What is your feeling about that? These devices uh, add another layer of security and provide a significantly more secure computer system today than we have ever had in the past. However, we have to be aware that no computer system commercially available today is adequately secure relative to the value of the assets, of the information assets uh, stored in them. Uh, therefore, we have to compensate for the technological uh, limitations in systems through operational, physical, procedural methods in order to make an organization secure that is using the computer. Don, we often look to the, the Japanese now for what they're doing in computers in general. Are the Japanese doing anything with regard to these security problems that we should be aware of? Well, the Japanese are a little bit behind in that they, are, they haven't um, experienced the kinds of computer crime that we have here in the United States. But they are just now starting to understand that problem. And, of course, they're trying to address uh, the U.S. market where they don't quite understand uh, the, the criminal problems that we have in this country. Crime is a very cultural thing, and so it's quite different from one country or culture to another. Are the laws adequate right now in our country to deal with this very sophisticated form of crime? Well, the laws are improving a great deal. We have a long ways to go. We have 21 states that now have specific computer crime laws, and we have several bills in Congress that would, if passed, provide specific protection on a federal, uh, nationwide basis. There's a, it seems like there's also a problem with uh, operating systems that are becoming popular nowadays that, that the source is available to them, to individuals. For example, Unix, um, that has become widely used in commercial environments. So what effect does that have when people that are really can get at the source programs uh, uh, have you seen any effect from that at all? We could uh, large operating systems like uh, the IBM operating systems that have years and years of security work. Uh, these po more popular operating systems now, what effect does that have? Well, Jackson's law says that with a big enough hammer you can break anything. And therefore, uh, any of these systems can be broken with a sufficient amount of work or skills, knowledge, and access. So it's a, a security is always a, a relative situation. And large computer programs are complex to the extent that they're not predictable. And if a program is not predictable, that is, if we don't know what it does under all circumstances, then we have to assume that it is not secure. Therefore, on a long-range research basis, we're aimed at developing the idea of a provably secure system where you could prove how it performs under all conditions and therefore gain some assurance that you have an adequately secure system. Don, we have just about one minute left. I want to ask you on a, we talked about war games earlier in the national defense area. How about economics? I mean, we have the banks now all tied to this massive electronic funds transfer system. What is the potential for a major economic disaster if the wrong guy got into that? Well, the, uh, the potential is uh, catastrophic. But the issue has to do with the risks involved. And we believe that security is advancing, along with advancing technology, and along with the increasing amount of money that is, uh, that is exposed in these large funds transfer systems. So that the risk is uh, relatively low today. But our major problem, however, is to make sure that the security, that the electronic fences built in these systems keeps up with that technology and with the amount of assets that become exposed in these systems. Real briefly, about 30 seconds left, what about cryptography? Is that a solution? Cryptography is the, um, is the most powerful safeguard, I think, that has ever been developed in protection of data. 
through, com through communication lines and also as might be stored in computer media. However, uh, we don't have a problem to solve in that uh, area yet, the eavesdropping problem. However, in the future, it will become the most significant safeguard that we have. Gentlemen, we're out of time. Don Parker of SRI, thank you very much for joining us. Jim Holmes of TriData, and I hope you'll be back with us again next time for another edition of the Computer Chronicles. It's very difficult to get a handle on how much computer crime there is. Companies that have been ripped off are often embarrassed and reluctant to report the crime. Prosecution of a company's employees for computer crimes is very rare. It may surprise you to know that only about half our states have computer crime laws, and federal legislation has lagged. So we really don't know how much computer crime there is. But we do know that computers have been involved in a number of well-publicized, multi-million dollar crimes. And that intrusion into host computers by unauthorized individuals is becoming commonplace. Our best defense is a good offense. First, we should not be psyched out by the computer technology. We can take responsibility for computer security without being a computer expert. And if needed, experts are available. Second, we should make an overall risk assessment of what our computer threats are and determine how much it is worth to protect against these threats. Third, we can take steps to physically protect our hardware and data, as previously mentioned. Fourth, we can use security checklist guidelines to ensure that our procedures are sufficient. Fifth, we can make sure that we address the greatest non-technical exposure, the users, by making our policies clear and by following common sense practices. In our next lesson, we'll cover the fascinating field of artificial intelligence. Be sure and read chapter 24 in your text. And I'll see you then. I'm Herb Lechner. Focus, creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. <laughs>